Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Here tonight, the Conservative MP and Brexit campaigner who resigned from Theresa May's cabinet last year after a series of top-level meetings in Israel that weren't authorised by number 10, Priti Patel. Labour's MP for Wigan, who previously served in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet, Lisa Nandy. Ian Blackford, the SNP's Westminster leader, who marched all of his MPs out of Prime Minister's questions last month. The columnist for The Times and The Spectator, Matthew Paris, and one of only two women in the country to run a football club, the CEO of Mansfield Town, Karen Radford. Thanks very much, and remember our hashtag BBCQT on social media if you want to use that. Our first question from Louise Benstead, please. Are we heading for a Brexit deal that works for the country or one that works for the Conservative Party? Right, one that works for the Conservative Party. Paris, Matthew. I, I, I have a great fear that we are heading for a Brexit deal that is designed to patch up disputes within the Conservative Party and is overlooking the interests of the country at large, especially the economic interests, the jobs, the industries that people rely on. It, it, seen from a distance, it's as though there were two sides to, the, to a great chasm and the Tories were all arguing about a small ditch on their side. But on the other side of the chasm is the European Union. We have to find a deal that they're prepared to do with us. We have to find a deal that business and industry are happy with. We have to find a deal that protects jobs. And Mrs May is spending far too much time protecting her back from the hard-line Brexiteers, of, of whom Pretty, I think, is one. Far too much time doing that instead of thinking of the economic interests of the British people. So, Pretty Patel, it's just the business of getting something that the Conservative Party can live with, is that right? I don't think so at all, no. I... I absolutely believe what the Prime Minister is seeking to achieve, and I heard her say it yesterday as well. She's very clear about the Brexit deal that she wants to achieve. She said it in Parliament again yesterday. We're very clear about free movement, ending free movement, leaving the customs union, the single market, you know, effectively taking back control. And let's not forget, that was a platform that the party and she was elected on last year. Now, I don't think it's a case of do we disagree or agree on any aspect of that. That is Conservative Party policy, that is government policy, and she's been abundantly clear about getting on and out there and dealing with that and delivering that for our country. The reality is, is quite frankly, I think we've been very open during the negotiations. And this isn't just about being a hard Brexiteer, Matthew. I think, you know, the fact of the matter is, during the discussions that have taken place with the European Union, you know, we've, had, we've just had an extraordinary time over the last two years where we're just sort of fed this daily diet of doom and gloom and pessimism while at the same time the European Commission, the European Commission and their representatives are quite frankly being quite disparaging about our country, trying to bully the government over this deal. And I think right now they need to calm down the rhetoric, stop thinking about themselves and absolutely work with the British government to deliver a good mm. deal on Brexit. I think you okay. need to calm down the rhetoric. <laughs> Oh. I, th I think you need to calm down the rhetoric. This is fighting talk, Pretty, but in the end, there's going to have to be give and take. There'll have to be give and take within the Conservative Party, and there'll have to be give and take with the European Union, but and you have to accept that. I think, Matthew, uh, there's, there's a point here is that, you know, what I have effectively outlined, that is obviously a Conservative Party position, the government's position, and, of course, this is a negotiation. I've been out over the last few years making that very point. This is a negotiation, but let's not forget the Commission themselves have been unreasonable. We've been very open over the last two years. I think we've been very open and very transparent in our offer to the Commission, to the European Union. Well, we've put things on the table. Well, on money, for example, on European citizens. Um, the fact that, obviously, we want the right kind of free trade deal All as right. well. Let, and, of course, Lisa, that, uh, that come is back about, to you. Lisa that Nandy, is, what do you say to that? That is about business. That is about the economics. Right. Lisa, and, of course, jobs Lisa, in this let, country let's, as well. Let's have everybody have a fair share. Lisa Nandy. I mean, the tragedy of all this for me is that 
two years on from the referendum, which should have been a huge wake-up call to uh, the British public and to politics about the frustration out there in large sections of the country, not just con in constituencies like mine that voted overwhelmingly to leave, but also amongst Remain voters as well. We're absolutely nowhere. We haven't begun to address the causes that gave rise to Brexit, the frustration that people feel about the lack of power and control they have over the things that most matter in their lives. And we're nowhere in the negotiations. Mm. If this was a football analogy, which is quite apt this week, we're not even on the pitch and the match is nearly over because the negotiations, the bullying and the threats are actually going on still two years later within the cabinet. The negotiations with Brussels haven't really begun. And that is in no one's interest. We had a result that was 52-48. That means for all the shouting, the tantrums, the threats within the cabinet, nobody won a clear mandate. The only clear mandate from this is to compromise. All and right. that means yes. that as we leave the European Union, we have to do so in a pragmatic way and we have to tone down this disgraceful rhetoric that is dividing right. our country. I'll go around the rest of the table in a moment. Let's just hear from one or two members of the audience. The woman in red with the second row from the back there. I'd like to say that I think it's just absolute arrogance on the part of Pretty and Boris and <laughs> Rhys Mogg. We had an election here. It was a very narrow victory for, um, for the Leavers. The EU is an enormous um, institution with huge power, and I look at it like it's a, it's a wedding reception that we have chosen not to go to, but we still want to, dic to dictate what music they're going to play at that wedding reception. We're, if we're out, then how can we possibly dictate to such a huge number of people with such enormous money and power what they are going to do for us? Okay. We have chosen to leave. I didn't. But... All right, we get the point. Ka Carolyn Rudd. <laughs> I just think that we all need clarity now. I think things have been the infighting within the party. I think that what business wants and what the people of the UK want now is to have some form of clarity, the third way, the fourth way. Let's not go down that route and let's, you know, hopefully tomorrow at Chequers, um, things will be a, a bit more decisive. Do you have a, a, an idea yourself which way things should go? Were you a Brexiteer or a Remainer? Um, I was a Brexiteer, but coming from um, a business side of things, we have a, a company in, the, in Europe that Brexit will actually cause problems if, if we don't um, have the a proper trade uh, okay. routes. You, sir, in the red shirt here. Well, coming back to the issue of rhetoric, uh, surely you negotiate with partners. All we hear from the Foreign Secretary, from the Brexit Secretary, even from the Chancellor of the Exchequer, is talking about the Euro our European partners as the enemy, as the opposition. Surely you negotiate successfully with partners. Not once have we heard our politicians talk about European politicians as partners. Yeah. Ian Black. What a shambles it is, isn't it? We're more than two years on from the referendum. And we still don't know what the Conservative government want to negotiate with Europe on. We've had the ridiculous situation that last weekend there was a European Council meeting. Our European partners waiting for the United Kingdom to tell them what we want. And the Prime Minister has called a Cabinet meeting for tomorrow. It's too late. The Council of Europe meeting has passed. And I have to say, I'm very afraid. We've had the announcement this morning from Jaguar Land Rover about the threat there is to their business. Companies that have complex supply chains that don't know if we're going to be in a trading relationship with Europe in a number of months. What a failure of leadership, because that's exactly what it is. And that's why I believe, friends, that both leavers and remainers are very angry about the complete failure of leadership that we've had from the <laughs> Conservative <laughs> government. And when I put it in... Let me put it this way to you, because there is, a, there is a real threat that we're heading to a no-deal scenario. And the government's own figures suggest that on that basis, the impact on GDP in the United Kingdom would be as much as 8%. Mark Carney of the Bank of England tells us that families on average are already £900 a year worse off. We've already lost jobs. The European, European Banking Authority, the European Medicines Agency, have already gone. 
This is the most ridiculous element of self-harm that we could possibly see. And any prime minister, any government, has a responsibility to look after its people, All right. not to leave them with a future on Thank the you. door. The woman here on the left. Yeah. Pretty, pretty claims that Theresa May has been clear, but she hasn't. All she said is Brexit means Brexit. She doesn't know what she means. Had this been a trade union vote, 52 to 48 wouldn't have stood up to question. And in matter of fact, when Pretty says that our EU uh, uh, comrades are taking a hard line, the first thing we should have done is offered the right to remain to all our EU citizens that are working hard and contributing to our economy here. And we didn't. So we set the hard line tone. Okay. Well, uh, Pretty, you, mm. you, you, you were interested. <laughs> you yourself were critical about the Prime Minister. You were asked whether it was a problem that the Prime Minister has avoided ever saying Brexit is a good idea, and you said, yes, there is something in that. I actually resent the negativity. Well, so you feel let down by the Prime Minister? I actually think the negativity is around the debate and the process. And, of course, we've had a lot of discussion over the, the last year. The question was yeah. about the Prime Minister has avoided ever saying Brexit is a good idea. That's what you well, resented. She has since said that we're going to be positive about Brexit. And actually, that's the context in which I made those remarks, that we should be much more positive. As a government, having campaigned on a manifesto during the general election last year to deliver Brexit under the premise, the um, position that Theresa May has put forward in particular and actually talk about you know trade negotiations trade deals the economics businesses jobs particularly up and down the country and Ian with all respect we're not seeing the job losses that you're referring to we're seeing new deals from businesses we're seeing positive economic growth Pretty, we've got the perhaps lowest in Scotland, we've perhaps got the in Scotland no, no. You have. we have got the lowest growth in G7 we've fallen to the bottom well, it, of the growth league we are seeing, and I think you have okay. to listen to the businesses like Jaguar Land Rover like BMW that have made it very clear Airbus that have talked about right, making come to, investments come elsewhere that, yeah. because of the risks in the yes. UK economy we'll... and it's the lack of clarity and I have to say to Pretty that if you want that free trade deal with Europe if you want to protect jobs that means you have to stay in the single market and the customs union it's the only way you're going to do it. talking such negative nonsense it is ridiculous we are leaving the EU there's a meeting tomorrow in cabinet things will be sorted as Matthew said some sort of compromise will have to ensue and it will you wait till tomorrow evening it'll all be agreed now let's not it will be agreed it will be agreed the fact is we are moving forward out of the EU and that's a damn good thing for our country and pretty is talking a lot of sense Matthew Paris I, you, yes, I, I can't let Pretty get away with the impression that she is supporting the Prime Minister. Uh, she's supporting the Prime Minister in, in words, but in reality she is part of that hardline group within the Conservative Party that are making trouble for Theresa May, that are threatening her with resignations, threatening her with her true. own position as Prime Minister, thre threatening her in every way. And y y y you, you, Pretty, are not helping Theresa May. You know you aren't. Your colleagues on the Conservative backbenches know that you aren't. You know that you're making trouble for her. Well, Ma Matthew, I think if, if I can just respond to that, you know, we've been back in the Prime Minister absolutely, and just last week oh, no. we got the EU withdrawal bill through Parliament. You know, that was through a negotiation with colleagues in Parliament, absolutely, and that was the right thing to do. You know, I'm not calling for the Prime Minister to go, so that's really wrong to even suggest that. And in terms of, you know, the position on Brexit in particular, those are the positions that she's put forward and we are constantly willing her on, wanting to support her and not only that, if I may say so, when it comes to the delivery of Brexit, her success with the delivery of Brexit will also lead to the success of our country and that is something that we all want. So would you, hang on a second, would you go along with Jacob Rees-Mogg who said an EU agreement that restricted the country's ability, I'm quoting him, to make trade agreements could not be accepted. Indeed, MPs would vote against such propositions. Well, what was I, described I, as a threat I, to the Prime Minister. Are you with him or not? I, I'm not. I'm not in the camp of threatening the Prime Minister at all. I want to see an independent free trade policy. That is Good. the right thing well, to do. Well, let's test. Let's test whether you're in the camp of wanting to threaten the Prime Minister. Say the result of the meeting at Chequers tomorrow is that Theresa May says that we have to accept that we must be in something like the customs union and something like the single market. Uh, will you support her? Well, it depends on what it is, because it's not something like the Customs no, Union. No, she, <laughs> if, if I may, the language and the framework that she's used is a partnership. You know, a partnership is the appropriate 
way of working. Now, any business deals, but, but any negotiations exactly, are based this on is, partnerships. This is a fallacy because what has been proposed, what we seem to see has been proposed, the so-called third way, it's what Europe has already defined as cherry picking, and Europe is not going to have it. You have to respect the traditions that, of the of the European Union. If you want to, the Prime Minister talks about wanting free trade and wanted to have frictionless trade with Europe. Well, there is a way of doing it. It is called the Single Market no. and Customs well, Union, clear. and we're it's the only way you're going this, to do it. And there are leave. many people in the Conservative Party that say that a no deal is better than a than a bad deal. Well, I can tell you, a no deal is going to be disastrous yeah. for the uh, people of the United Kingdom. I'd like Kingdom. to hear from some more members. There is the man up there in the second row from the back. You yep. say in the white shirt, yes. Yeah. Uh, if you happen to look out in the car park here, you'll see virtually all the cars are German or Fr French. Uh, so I think they need us as much exactly. as we need them. OK. And you say in the very front here. <laughs> yes. I was, going, I was going to say about the, the original question, how naive can the Conservative government be that they didn't imagine the EU were going to play hardball? Utterly ridiculous. They were just completely naive. Of course they were going to play hardball. Yeah. You d they didn't even think about the, the way out of the EU before they started the Brexit negotiations. Can I go to Louise Benson to ask the question, what's your view of what you've heard? And then... Yeah. Well, I think we were, we were dragged into this referendum because of the splits in the Conservative Party yes, over this yeah. issue. And I feel like it's just they're making it up as they go along. I agree with what the gentleman just said there. There was really no thought about... Um, the, remain, uh, the, the Leave campaign winning and they didn't really know what we were going to do and I feel now that the Prime Minister is being bullied and we, you know, I'd like to be positive about Brexit but it just doesn't feel like I can be at the moment. Let, let me take a question Mr Chowdhury please if I may just on the same, on the same issue and then we... Yes. Okay. In view of the growing number of companies and now Jaguar Land Rover predicting dire consequences of a bad Brexit deal Shouldn't the people have a final vote on the deal? So whatever comes out of it, you want a final vote? Yes. Ben <laughs> Blackford, you go for that? Well, and the problem is that there doesn't seem to be great appetite amongst the other political parties for it. What I want to do is to make sure that we can stay in the single market and the customs union. I would simply say to the Prime Minister this. She may have a problem with her Brexiteers that... Uh, want to threaten the livelihood of people in this country. But if the Prime Minister trusts Parliament, I believe there is a majority in the Houses of Parliament to stay in the single market and the customs union. Now, I make no apology for the fact that I'm a Scottish MP and I have to protect the interests of the people of Scotland. And we're in a slightly different position because we won the election in Scotland in 2016 on a mandate that if there were a change in circumstances, that we have the option of having an independence in Scotland's future. And my priority will be to make sure that the people of Scotland have that choice and that we can protect our future as a European nation. Those of you here that want to come and join us are more than welcome as we make sure that we have our own destiny as a European nation. So you're going to have another referendum for Scotland, are you? Is that yeah, an independence well, referendum instead of a referendum about, on this? It is about, it's about democracy. I cannot see... Yeah, but I just want to pin you down to it. Yes, you, I'm you, going you, to answer the question for you, David. Okay, I cannot you. see how that can happen in the UK because there is no pressure for that from the Labour Party or the Conservative Party. So you want a, another referendum do, on Scottish? Well, yes, when do you want it? Well, because we, people in Scotland, voted to remain within the EU by mm. a decisive majority. And the responsibility that I have and the First Minister has is to protect the interests of the people of Scotland. And if we are dragged out of Europe and we are dragged out the single market in the customs union, then we must have the right to put the future of Scotland to the people of Scotland. We have a mandate for... A, when for would you like to do that? Well, we will, we will take that decision once we know what the outcome is of the Brexit process. But it is right that the people of Scotland are given that option at that time. And I believe that the people of Scotland will seek to protect their future as an independent European nation. Mm. OK. Man up there in white. In the shirt there in the middle. Yeah. Ian, you refer to democracy and having a mandate, but it's quite ironic that you should suggest that is the way, because the Conservative Party won the last general election on the premise that we would leave the single market and the customs union. And so to now suggest that we would not do so is the opposite of democracy. Matthew Paris, what do you make of the argument for us? How, how do you think the process should I, th out? I, I think that the referendum showed that uh, a small majority of the British people wanted the government to negotiate a deal to leave the European Union. Once that deal has been negotiated, I think we ought to be able to say, either by a referendum or in a general election, whether that deal is acceptable to us or not. So you would... 
So you go for either a referendum or a general yes. election? Yes. What would you say to that? Well, I'd say no to another referendum. You know, we had the referendum. The public voted in that referendum two years ago. And the government are getting on and will deliver Brexit. And, you know, I have confidence in the Prime Minister when it comes to this process. And she is our Prime Minister and it's for her to absolutely secure the right kind of Brexit, as we've just discussed. What about an election to I, I, I don't think so. Absolutely no, because we had the manifesto last year, and that is democracy. In the same way in which we see various constituencies and parts of the country that voted, you know, in Labour seats in particular, in a very heavy way to leave the European Union. And, of course, there are a range of reasons as to why people voted to leave the European Union. Yes. But I, th I think it's important, once we do leave, that we start to address a whole raft of those causes, those issues and concerns. Okay. Karen, and that is a pragmatic and responsible Karen, what about you? the government. What do you think? I think we need to get behind the Prime Minister now. We are where we are and we've just got to get on with navigating the process as best as we can and all pull together as a nation. And if you get some deal... <laughs> if you get some deal that's far less than what you wanted and stays much closer to the EU than you wanted, you just lump it with you and say, well, that's it. I think there's going to be great debate on both sides and I'd hope that the Conservative Party do navigate the, the, to, as on the right po uh, position and path. Lisa Nandy, what would Labour do? You've heard Matthew Paris saying there should be some final judgment on this deal. Are you in favour of some final judgment? No, I think it's right that Parliament has a vote on the deal with the option to instruct Theresa May to go back and renegotiate if we don't like it. But the trouble is this, that the clock is ticking. We've got about four months until we're supposed to have reached agreement on this. Um, and um, we don't actually know what we would be voting on. We haven't got a clue and we're two years on from the referendum. And the trouble for me is that I think we're in danger of replicating the mistakes that we made the first time around. We had an in-out referendum and we spent two years then arguing as a nation about what that result actually meant. And there isn't clarity, actually, about a second referendum, about whether we would be asking people to vote for a final deal or to reject Brexit altogether, but, 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 or to vote for a final deal and then to send Theresa May back to the negotiating table. And the question started with the warnings by business, which I've also heard privately from businesses in my constituency. I don't think there's any understanding in politics at the moment about the urgency of this situation. What businesses are saying to us is not that they couldn't live with some compromise. What they're saying is they can't live with the lack of clarity. And the longer that we delay the more likely it is that those investment decisions right. go elsewhere. And that's people's jobs and their lives, and it is unacceptable. You, sir. <clears throat> I actually just find it very scary. Ian says he does have a mandate in Scotland because he has a majority. We are fighting to get something through Parliament, regardless of who you vote for, and Theresa May will come out of checkers and make a phone call over to Belfast to somebody she had to pay £1.5 billion to to get them on board. <laughs> and that's what our whole in or out depends upon. I, I think that's yeah. And you're at the very back, and then I think we must move on to another question. You said the very, very back there in the blue shirt. Yes. Um, two points as you're dealing with two sort of similar questions. Yeah. Firstly, the United Kingdom will not leave the European Union without a deal. The European Union won't let it. Because if we left with no deal, the disaster would affect both sides severely. So that's one point. The second point about the people's vote. If you're going to have a people's vote, a people's referendum on the deal, you cannot have a parliamentary vote at the same time because the two would conflict. You either have one or the other. I think that's what Matthew was suggesting, not mm. both. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm. OK, thank you very much. Let's move on to another question. Just before we do, we're going to be at the Mick Jagger Centre in Dartford next Thursday for question time. And there on the, de the screen are the details of how to apply. I'll give them again in at the end. The Mick Jagger Centre. <laughs> um, we can offer all kinds of excitements. Um, Elliot Simpson, let's have your question, please. If England continue to progress at the World Cup, should the UK government now send a representative? Should government send a representative to the World Cup? Carolyn Radford. I do. I, I love the way that football brings people together and it's a universal language. And, it, you, you know, it might actually improve relations with the UK and Russia 
if we do send a representative over there, um, obviously it's a little bit of a, um, a tentative subject at the moment. Um, but, you know, I, I definitely think, believe that we should send and, you know, maybe the Prime Minister, if we do progress to the final, should, should be in attendance. And the Skripal affair and the two further... Yeah. I mean, we don't know. I don't know the ins and outs of, of the facts of what's happened. You'd like to see you know, them go. Ian Backford, would, would you? Yeah. No, definitely not. We have to reflect on what happened in Salisbury. The fact that people have had their lives threatened on the streets of the United Kingdom is completely unacceptable and we need to send a very clear message to the regime in Moscow that we're going to stand firmly against the kind of state-sponsored terrorism that we've seen. It's not acceptable. And I'm glad... <laughs> I'm glad that there has been largely a cross-party consensus on that issue. Now, I, I can understand why people would be torn about wanting to go to the World Cup. It's a fantastic theatre of, of football that we've seen over the course of the last two weeks. And I, I'm glad to see that people in England have joined the spectacle, that they've enjoyed getting through to the, the later stages. And I wish you all the best, by except the way. For those, the, except for the, except, the, except, for the, except, the, except the, those English MPs who weren't I, able to watch it because you forced votes in the House of Commons well, hang on, to stop hang them going on, to hang see on, the yeah. Yeah. Hang on, David. <laughs> except hang, on, hang on, hang on. Sorry, That's actually... Right. Right. That's actually not strictly correct. Let me, perhaps let me just say to the audience votes. what happened. Five votes, actually. But what happened was that the government scheduled business for Tuesday. It was important business. It was about us voting on the estimates. It was about government spending. So the guilty party were the government that laid the business down for Tuesday evening, because that was our only opportunity to say to the government that we don't accept what you're doing with austerity. We reject the fact that the people of Scotland and the United Kingdom have suffered austerity since 2010. Can I read you what one and of your was, SNP was, members that was, that said? Was Just opportunity. Opportunity. interrupt you a moment. That was our you opportunity. You have an MP called Peter Grant who tweeted, thanks to impeccable timing of votes by the SNP, at the very moment England scored Tory whips, you have no idea how much influence we really have. Was he just making well, look, you the, I mean, <laughs> the simple fact of the matter is that we were doing our job as a parliamentary party to stand up against Tory austerity. And it's regrettable that the Conservative whips and the Conservative okay. government scheduled that business for a Tuesday night. They're responsible for Let's that. Come back I to would the World far Cup. rather right. have enjoyed the World Cup on Tuesday evening. <laughs> come back to the World <laughs> Cup. Matthew Parrish. Yeah, that's the SNP view. It's always somebody else's fault, isn't it? Oh. Yes. <laughs> Responsible for parliamentary business. I wish, I, I wish we were. The, <laughs> the, the people of Great Britain are completely in, uninterested, do not give a toss whether ministers go to the, Russia for the finals or don't. The only person who cares is uh, our ministers themselves. It would be ridiculous for Theresa May, having said that ministers will not go to Russia, suddenly to go or to send ministers just because we're doing well in the World Cup. She made a fool of herself cavilling, currying favour with uh, Donald Trump. I don't think she should repeat that mistake with, with Mr Putin. <laughs> Lisa, Lisa um, I don't think for a moment that she should be sending people to the World Cup. We, I have to say to you, Ian, actually, we did watch it anyway, so I don't know what your little game was, <laughs> but it didn't work. And everyone in this country is... Well, actually, Lisa, if you'd voted for, with us, we would have defeated the government on the last two votes. And it's regrettable that, once again, Labour oh. sat on their hands oh. when we could have defeated the government oh, on the <laughs> Anyway, if I could get back to the football, <laughs> yeah. um, it, it, everyone in this country is behind the England team. It's shaping up to be the most brilliant World Cup that I can remember. I had great fun explaining to my little boy that we never win matches on penalties and then being proven <laughs> catastrophically wrong, which was, um, was great. Um, but of course we shouldn't be sending um, officials and dignitaries to pay tribute to Putin because he would be the great winner from that. We should be showing solidarity with anyone who believes in free and fair elections around the world, with the LGBT community around the world, with children in Syria, with the people of the Crimea, and we should not play with propaganda games. Yeah. All right, you, sir, in the one, two, three, fourth row there. Um, I'm not a particularly big football fan, but in general, if I'm working and there's a sporting event that I want to watch, then that's tough for me, but I can't watch that at that time. The fact that there was a vote whilst their MPs want to watch football is ultimately irrelevant. It is their job to vote on things. OK. Uh, Bridget Patel. 
Well, the answer is no. Ministers should not be going to Russia mm. at all. And, you know, I think the nation is united in cheering our team on because they've been phenomenal during this World Cup. And our, you know, Gareth Southgate has been an incredible manager as well, I think, in terms of the way in which he's led his team too. So, you know, we wish them the best. We really do. And we'll continue to cheer for them. But I think, as Lisa has said, you know, in light of Russia, what Russia has been doing, its malign influence, on our own doorstep as well, there are two people in hospital right now um, because of another outbreak in terms of spreading Novacek. You know, these malign forces are absolutely shocking. And the British government has been very clear about standing up to Russia, but also with our international partners when it comes to Syria, the use of chemical weapons is absolutely appalling. So we must absolutely continue to hold firm on this whole thing. The, the woman there in the back. Uh, just as a, a Scotsman, live, a Scots person living in England, it could be seen as sour grapes on the SNP's part to put their parts on when it comes to Scotland not being anywhere near the World Cup. No, I never have. Well, you'll be very brief, will you? Very brief. We wanted to signal to the Conservative government that they've done something really important, and that is that they've taken back powers from the Scottish Parliament and they pushed through votes from that two weeks earlier with no debate. And people in Scotland are rightly angry. And we've said to the UK government, don't expect business from usual for us. And what we will do is we will hold the UK government to account as people in Scotland would expect us to do. Thank you. And the, the gentleman there in the blue shirt. Yes, you, sir. I think never mind ministers and officials, why were we so afraid to send our own supporters to Russia? Um, Liverpool had a match against Spartak Moscow last year, uh, I think it was in September. There was no trouble with fans. Uh, Celtic had a game in St. Petersburg <laughs> early in the year. There was no trouble. Why was there smear campaigns in the press um, telling England fans not to go to the World Cup? OK. Uh, ones you're talking about was before the script of poisoning. No? Yeah, and yes. the... The campaign from the media continued after the Skripal affairs. The, the, the man there, two in front of you, and then we'll move on. Russia's um, policies against gays, lesbians, um, their policies towards immigration and things like that. This is why they, we were told not to go to Russia. It's because we don't want our own people to be affected by these policies. OK. Let's go on to another question. Uh, Andrew Livesey, please. After 70 years, the NHS is now a sacred cow. Isn't it time for serious reform now? Serious? What do you mean by serious reform? We are accepting the way the NHS is at the moment, and we need to sort of get in there and to re sort out the waste and all the money that's just, just wasted generally and the way the whole thing is run and it's over-managed and things like that. And you said it's a sacred cow, meaning that nobody dares really... Nobody dares to sort it out. The, part, the different parties have different ideas. They, they don't really do it quite right. And maybe a Royal Commission may be a good idea. OK, Priti Patel. Yes, well, look, I think that's a really good suggestion. And, I, you know, I'd like to see the day where we stop almost, you know, treating the NHS uh, as some kind of political row constantly between all the political parties. I think we are seeing change and reform in the NHS. We're seeing much more localised provision in the NHS. I'm certainly speaking from my own experience in my constituency, where we're seeing a greater focus on not people going to hospital, but local health centres. And, you know, the service within the NHS being brought closer to patients. That is a good thing. And let's not forget, we have a range of challenges now. We're changing demographics. Um, you know, we're living for longer. Sometimes you moan about that, but actually that's a good thing. and We should celebrate that. And our needs are changing. So You're it in seems... favour of the increase in funding and increase in taxation? I think we it? need to absolutely ensure that we are resourcing the NHS in the right kind of way. Even so if that means tax if it, if it means more money, which obviously the government has committed to, then I welcome that, and that's a good thing. In terms of... General taxation, well, of course, we pay for the NHS through our taxes, and that will always continue. So, you know, I think, again, we have to look at reform. The NHS, we've all got amazing stories, you know, in terms of the NHS, our own personal experience.
experiences, whether we've used A&E with our children or with relatives as well, we all have. The NHS has touched all our lives. So I think it's right and proper that, A, we fund the NHS in the right kind of way, but also that the NHS continues to move with the times. It adapts, it changes to the challenges that we see, the challenges we face, whether it's in technology, which I think is what the government has been speaking about, but also some of the big demographic pressures that we have around the country too. I thought you were rather critical of the spending increases when they first came in, when they were first announced by the Chancellor. No, I mean, we need to pay for the NHS. I mean, that's, that's a fact through general taxation. It we shouldn't do that mean anyway. spending splurges. Well... Fiscal, sound fiscal management should be a priority. Do well, you, do you mean all that? Doesn't, that's that's, that's the code priority. for don't put up price, uh, taxes, isn't the it? Sound fiscal management should be, the right should be the policy for any government, basically, making sure that we're not borrowing. But then how more, are you going to pay for well, it? Well, we, we shouldn't. We have to live within our means, Lisa, as well. You know, that's a fact. That's... <laughs> Matthew it is Paris. a fact that so we you don't, don't you don't want to fund it. I, I think in, in I said I do want to fund it, and it's right that we fund the NHS in the right way. Matthew Paris. In, in, a, in a world in which there, there are fifth rate, fourth rate, third rate, second rate, first rate health services, I think we get a second rate health service for the cost of a third rate health service. In other words, we get very good value from the NHS, but it isn't as good a health service as it could be. And I think we have to accept that if it's to be free at the point of use, and, and most of us more or less agree about that, then it can only be governed uh, by shortages, uh, by queues, uh, by occasional cash crises. Something has to stop health spending continuing to spiral upwards in, in an age when people are getting older and medical treatment is getting more and more sophisticated and drugs more expensive. There has to be something that keeps the lid on it. And I'm afraid that at the moment what keeps the lid on it is wait waiting lists. It's the fact that if you go to A&E you may have to wait four or five hours. I would go to A&E much more often than I ever have if I got immediate treatment. So if we want this free at the point of use NHS we have to be prepared for queues, for waiting lists and for every now and again an occasional cash crisis. And are you in favour at all of people who can afford it paying for their treatment? Oh, yes. I mean, I, I ought to pay £25 to go to the doctor. I, I can afford as a, it. As a, as a government policy, you'd have Yes, that. yes, I, yeah, absolutely. No, I would be perfectly happy to make a contribution. I, I, I've got plenty of money. A lot of people don't. The, the woman here. That is the yes. start of going private. Hold on, wait Look. a second, just yeah. say it again. That is the start of going private. No, yes, absolutely. never. Karen Radford. I think something's got to give. I think the NHS is absolutely stretched. Um, I fear for doctors and nurses' mental well-being, um, uh, the capacity that we're, we're working to at the moment. And I don't think people would mind actually paying that little bit more in taxes exactly. to ensure protecting um, our, the brand NHS that we all love. Mm. You, the woman behind her, yes. Absolutely. And the gentleman said about uh, reorganising the NHS, David Cameron said no more top-down reorganisation of the NHS and then proceeded to do a costly three billion reorganisation of the NHS. And we are now faced with a further reorganisation with the introduction of sustainability and transformation plans. They're not going to do local people any good when they're taking funds and valuable resources out of our local hospitals. Mm. So we need to stop this and we need to fund fund social care to the same degree to stop people unnecessarily staying in hospital when they can be looked right. after in their communities. The woman in green there. It all boils down to money, OK? We mm. live in a country where, where we pay top footballers more than a hundred times a, ner a nurse um, gets. Surely that needs looking at. How would you look at it? Basically, I don't think we should be living in a country where there, there is such disparity between, between um, sort of salaries. Yes, I mean, what footballers earn, I just think is ludicrous. It's painful. Take some of that money off, distribute it, OK? National Health Service sorted a little bit, maybe. Lisa Nandy. Uh, of course we've got to pay for the National Health Service and we've got to be honest about how we're going to do it. It's not enough to say you're coming up with 20 billion on the back of an envelope but you don't know how you're going to pay for it. We've been honest and said that we want the top 5%
of earners to pay a bit more and actually I think the public are very supportive of that but it's not just that either we've got to end the stranglehold of private companies who are bleeding money out of our national health service Can I, can I just stop you a second? Can you just explain what you mean by bleeding money mm -hmm. out of it? Because the National Health Service says they give contracts to people on the basis of the cheapest deal, the best deal for the NHS. Well, I'll tell you how this works. So I have... I've just come from Wigan, where I live, where I've been standing with staff on the picket line. Cleaners, porters, caterers, who are out on strike at the moment because they're being forced into a private company out of the NHS, which they're proud for work for, and creating a two-tier workforce in our NHS, which will be bad for them and bad for patients. Why is it happening? Because those private companies get tax breaks when they compete for contracts that the NHS can't access. That puts private companies at an advantage and our public sector at a disadvantage. We've got to end this madness. It's bad for all of us. And finally, I would just say this. You cannot save the NHS if you don't take seriously what's happening in social care at the moment. Local, that was a made over there. Local authorities mm. are on their knees after eight years of cuts. They're bringing in less money in council tax at the moment than they're spending out just in vulnerable adult and children care alone. We can't go on like this. Every time I go to my local hospital, I see older people who've been admitted to hospital simply because they don't have the care that they need at home. And too often, those older people die in hospital instead of going home to their loved ones. We've got yeah. to fund uh, that. But uh, uh, and, Andrew, <laughs> Andrew Niggs' point was about serious reform. Does that answer your point or not? No, no, it doesn't. I think we've really got... You hear the two parties talking. We must have a Royal Commission. How do we set this up? What does Parliament have to do to set up a Royal Commission? How do we do it? I don't know. How do we do it? You've got to get government to want to engage. So i just say this, that it's a bit rich for Pretty to say we need cross-party working. Because the truth is that all of the political parties in Parliament have been trying, including <coughs> backbench Tory MPs, have been trying to get a cross-party commission to be taken seriously on mental health for a really long time, and they are stalled constantly so by the lack of action from this government. So you've got to get government to respond, let's otherwise have a it's never going to work. All bickering. Let's have a Royal Commission. You, right. you, in, in Blackford, I'll come to you. Well, you know, I think what we should be doing is celebrating the birthday, 70 years old, the National Health Service, something we've all benefited from. It has been a marvellous achievement for all of us. Why are we celebrating the 70th birthday? I mean, 50th birthday, 60th birthday, well, every 10 years we well, celebrate? Well, no, it's what? an important milestone, and if I may say so, actually, the why legacy... Is it, I don't understand why it's a milestone. I'm sorry to be because, because about Because what this. it's done over such a long period of time is looked after our needs from cradle to grave. I know all that, but why and, well, suddenly... Is this a political gesture that's no, celebrating it's not, it's the not. I think everybody, I think everybody should be celebrating the fact really? that the health service has endured so long. And it's Did something... we celebrate the 60th? Oh, look, David, we're here today at 70 <laughs> years old. It is something which is worth no, no, because it's but at its, its 60th birthday, the NHS wasn't attacked from under attack from its own government. But, and it is now, and that's why we need to celebrate. But if I mean, so this celebration, if I mean, this celebration is an anti-government celebration. No, this is about the championing government. the principle behind okay. the NHS. It, it, it is there for all I mean, of us, okay. and it's We funded. have a health service, certainly in Scotland, that we're proud of, and it goes back much further than 70 years, actually, because the Highlands and Islands Medical Service goes back to 1913, the first public health service in the, in the world, something that we cherish. But we've got a, a duty of care to the health service to make sure we look after it. And actually, in Scotland, we are well down the road of integrating uh, social care and health in Scotland. And by the way, in our budget, we did increase taxes for those earning more than £33,000 a year. And one of the reasons that we did it is because we want to make sure that our healthcare workers get a decent pay increase. And that's exactly what we've done. Let's make sure we invest in healthcare. Let's make sure that it can deliver for the people, whether it's here or elsewhere in the United Kingdom. That should be the top priority of every politician. B. Oh. And, and, and the, the woman there behind the man of red, now come to you, Matthew. Yes. Um, should we not, as users of the National Health Service, take responsibility for some of the situation that it finds itself in today? People who misuse and abuse um, A&E people who misuse and abuse general practitioners, who don't turn up for appointments, who go to the hospital when there is absolutely no need for them to go. Surely that is what should be happening if we're going to celebrate a 70th birthday, is to take it back to, this is your health service, 
please take responsibility for it and look after it. Karen Radford, do you agree with that? I do, absolutely. I think, and I, there's been big. Um, I make sure that I go to the chemist and I get advice from there if my child falls over and hurts themselves. You know, I, I think it, there has to be, we have to have a lot more respect for when we actually need to go and seek medical attention. Obviously, when we do need to, it's there for us. Um, but maybe that would help reduce, you know, waiting times in hospitals if you don't have the people using the service um, and abusing it. But both, both Lisa Nandy and the lady over there said that we must pay more for social care. And I'm sure we must, but the, this is not going to be a popular suggestion. The Conservative Party did come up with a plan for paying for social care at the last election. Then, when they saw how unpopular it was, they panicked and abandoned it. And but they the, didn't the, consult the plan, on it, Matthew. The, the, they didn't the, have the a plan, conversation with I'm, the people I'm just going or across Parliament I'm just going to tell you to what try and plan, get a consensus. tell you what the plan is. And you, you can say whether you agree with it or not. The, the plan was that where elderly people have very substantial savings or capital assets, down to a certain threshold, that should be used to fund their social care until that threshold is reached. And the reason that was so unpopular is, is, is not because it would hurt old people, it wouldn't hurt them at all. It's because their sons and daughters are not going to inherit as much as they did before. There you are, you hear the boos from the audience. There was a plan for funding Wonderful. social care, you, and we don't but like why, it. But Bridget why, Patel, but why hang on, was it hang on, landed hang on, on Lisa, even her own hang on, MPs Lisa, please. without any notice? Hang on, That's Bridget Patel, did you approve of the plan that was in the Conservative Manifesto? Well, like, like, like most things with the Manifesto, we heard about it after it was published, so, you know, there was no consultation. When you read it, did you approve it or not? No, no because we, it, it was basically a proposal, and it, I think it said very clearly at the time that there'd be further work that would come out in terms of it was a concept, it was an idea that's being floated. But what would you have said if there was a consultation? Well, would if be you'd so, been we, consulted, but I, but I'm I, consulting but you I, now. But I think, I think, Matthew, it's important <laughs> to be part of that discussion and to look at a oh. range of options as well. I think, I think that's right. I think that's right and proper. But there are two points here. Have you not seen it at all? No, I hadn't, no. So you've got the Tory manifesto that really you were fighting in election. It wouldn't on. have been my, you know, it wasn't my department, so I was not in, involved in any aspect you were of that in government. at all. No, I was, not in, I was not involved or consulted in that, and I gather many other people were not at the time, Is too. Is that odd? I thought it was odd, of course, exactly. And it, that, I mean, that's, many of us said that at the time. Is that, is, that, is that why you lost uh, or didn't win the election, the glorious... Well, day? I mean, look, we can all rewrite history, can't Jeremy, we, in terms of, did, in terms did, of the did, election. Did Mr Hunt know? You'll have to ask Jeremy. You I think know? I think Jeremy, in fact, to his credit, the Secretary of State at the time, you know, Jeremy Hunt, was out talking about the policy. So obviously he he had been involved in that policy. Somebody was waving very no, not you, sir, but somebody at the a woman at the very back. I will come to you in a moment, but the woman at the very back there, yes. It goes without saying that of course everybody should use the NHS responsibly, but let's not forget how we got into this situation. It wasn't because people were missing appointments. Under the last Labour government, and I'm very critical of lots of things the Labour government did, we had the longest sustained period of investment in the NHS since it was founded, and by the end of that period we had the highest satisfaction levels since it was founded. Yeah. It's because of the ideologically led assault by her government that is trying to dismantle oh. the NHS. Do not pass the vote. No. The man, man in the second row from the back with a blue hat on. Bring it, bring <laughs> it, bring it down to a human level. I had experience of being in the, our own wonderful Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth Hospital in Kings Lynn last year for eight days. The actual treatment I got there was excellent and they're worth every penny the medical staff yeah. are paid. OK, and you, sir, in the front. Row. <laughs> no, 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 the man there. Yes. Surely the failure to integrate social care and health care budgets yeah. is the economics of the yeah. madhouse. Yeah. It's yeah. crackers yeah. where we save small yeah. amounts of money providing care in the community exactly the and point. spend huge amounts keeping people bed blocking yeah. in hospitals. And you've got MPs on both sides of me here nodding with agreement with what you're saying. So, so, so why, why don't we get on, on with yeah. it and deal with We've it? it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We've done it in Scotland. Why haven't we done it in England? Because it's expensive. <laughs> Why hasn't it been done in England? Well, you were nodding in agreement. Well, I do. I completely agree with that. But also with mental health provision as well. Lisa touched on that too. You know, if you go to A&E, I've been in A&E twice this year. <coughs> and, you know, it's really shocking to see the type of people that are coming in when they could be helped much closer to home and in the community. So I think this isn't just about the Department of Health. 
going forward, this has to be a cross-government effort with other government expensive. departments. Well, of course it's expensive, okay. but we need to look but at ways in which we fund it. But you've got to be prepared to take as well. It's the point. In Scotland, it I works. Hate and people are benefiting from it. But, but at the same time, we have to look at how we can do this it's in, it's West cheaper in the long run. government department. It's cheaper to care for people in the community than it is, than it is in hospitals. All right, let's stick with the community. Let's stick with the community and let's stick with hard politics and take a question from Mary Sacri, please. Affecting Kings Lynn specifically, but applying to the country as a whole. Yes. Will the introduction of universal credit in Kings Lynn? fuel more demand of our food bank? There has been evidence that where universal credit is rolled out, the effect is for food bank use to go up. Matthew Paris, what do you think of... The theory, the theory of, of universal credit is a very persuasive one. It, it, it is that you earn your way out of poverty and that uh, nobody is better off out of work than in work. That's the theory. The practice is, I think it's the Treasury's fault, it has been starved of the resources it would have needed. It needed to be generous, at least in the introduction. Uh, it, the, 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 the wait, was it five or six weeks before you get paid, seemed to me exceedingly hard-hearted. And I think if you're going to bring in a revolutionary new idea like universal credit, you, you really have to provide the funds, the, the sweeteners, to make it work. And I, I don't think the Treasury has ever liked universal credit, and they're trying to kill it, and they may well succeed. Um, Lisa Nandy, what do you think should have happened uh, to Esther McVeigh, who was criticised in the House of Commons this week for distorting the effect of universal credit being rolled out? Well, we've had... She apologised for it. Do you think she should have gone? Of course I think she should have gone. I mean, we had, we've had universal credit, actually, in Wigan for five years because we were one of the pathfinder areas that trialled it before. So for five years we've been telling her department that there are problems and then you have this National Audit Office report which is signed off by her department which says that 40% of people on universal credit are in financial difficulties and the government should pause this and not put more people onto it until they know that it can work. And yet what does she do? She comes to Parliament and she tells us that everything is great, that it just needs to be rolled out more quickly. Either she has no idea of the impact that her flagship policy is having on people across this country or she deliberately misrepresented this to Parliament. And I'll say this to you, that I've had constituents in the last five years who've made tiny mistakes on their forms or who've asked to miss an appointment so that they could go to a family funeral or who've been three minutes late for an appointment and they have been sanctioned and they have lost everything. Mm. Esther McVeigh came to Parliament t twice and misrepresented what was in that report. She's come and apologised, but she's still got her job, she's still got a ministerial salary, she's still got her ministerial car, she hasn't resigned, and Theresa May must sack her. Did you tell? Well... I actually think when it comes to universal credit, it is now a policy that's been established in government and it's one that needs to be supported. And with that, I think we have to look at the practical ways in which the government is rolling out universal credit. So and just before you go on to that, what do you make of what Lisa's just said about sacking Esther McVeigh? Esther apologised to Parliament yesterday and she gave a statement in Parliament. So I, I don't think she should be sacked. But there's that... no benefit of a doubt for people who are on universal Lisa, Lisa. credit. If her department won't you made, show you, compassion you made your point. for people no, on universal Lisa, you credit, made why your point. I'm she asking, get that level of You've made your point, I'm letting her so reply. So sacking a minister and replacing a minister will not solve the problems in, you know, immediately. And I think actually... The focus now has to be on making sure that universal credit works for the people that are on universal credit, that they don't get the glitches in payment, that they are supported. And I think, actually, where we should look at this from the human element is that one-on-one -on -one support that should come from the job centres while people are transferring onto universal credit and giving them all the help that they need. You know, it's pretty obvious through the NAO report and through some of the past cases that have been... Um, come up as well, that it's not a perfect system. Matthew actually touched on the fact of the taper, the money that came from the Treasury. Um, there were problems, there's no doubt about that. I remember at the time I was involved in DWP, I was a minister. Yeah. In fact, my former Secretary of State resigned because of the rouse with the Treasury that we were not being funded enough. 
And that is part of the problem. So ensuring that the money is going into the system to support people is the priority. And I don't think changing the ministers at all will alter right. that. Mary Sackery asked this question. Is food bank use rising in Kingsley? I think it is. <coughs> My background is family law. And <coughs> for me, it was incredible to see how working mums, young mums, single mums, sort of flourished under working tax credits when they were introduced. And I would be so angry if those women, and most men where relevant, um, suffered uh, you know, under universal credit. If it's going to work, make it work. Hmm. <laughs> Carolyn Radford. Well, I'm, I'm obviously around Mansfield, which is um, an area of deprivation uh, within the UK. And I would just hope that universal credit, is, although it's supposed to simplify a very complicated system, I'm worried about the alarm and distress that it's going to cause um, the people in my community. Is food bank use high in Mansfield? Yes, it is. Yeah. And the universal credit, what state is it in? Is it being rolled out there? Um, I believe so, yeah. Uh, Ian? You know, Pretty, I, I have to say to you with respect, you say that universal credit needs to be supported. It's not universal credit that needs to be supported, it's those that are in receipt of universal credit need to be supported. And the reality is, <laughs> the, the Trussell Trust have told us that in areas where universal credit has been rolled out over a 12-month period, that food bank use has increased by 52%. That's what's happened as a result of universal credit. And I can tell you in my constituency, it's been, ro it's been rolled out. I have people coming to my surgeries every week. And it's disastrous to sit and listen to the stories. And often you're talking about very vulnerable people. You're talking about people with mental health issues. You're talking about people with anxiety. And they've been put into a situation that they're facing eviction because of the situation that this Tory government has put them in. It's cruel. It's inhumane. The minister has led, misled Parliament. She should go. The policy should go. Okay. Who would like to make a point on that? Up there, the person. Yes, the woman in the second row from the back. We're coming to the end, so be brief if you would. Yeah. Um... I think that the point of a, a trial and a rollout is to look at the, what, what works and what doesn't work. And it seems to me that we are just ignoring what doesn't work and we're just trying to push for it to work. We need to, for it to work, we've, we've got to look at, at, at both sides and act on them. And you, sir, in the second row there. If I'm going into work and I lie to my business, I'm going to get sacked. The only way that you MPs get sacked is if you go on holiday to Israel. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that, on, that, on that sharp point, I think we've nearly... I'll just take one more point from the woman in pink. Very brief, if you would. I think it's absolutely disgusting in this day and age that there are food banks at all. We should be looking after each other and feed some human beings, too. If it takes less money for certain people to make it better for other people, that's what should be happening. We should be looking after each other. Thank you very much. RR is up now.